Really excited to be here to just talk about project planning and getting your project off to a good start. So much of the work that we do really is about that pre-planning before we actually work the project. So we have speakers here today from Maryland Legal Aid who are going to talk about their process of build, rolling out a project. And we're going to start off first with some key principles. So welcome everyone and thank you for coming. So just some reminders. Remember, please mute yourself during the presentation because we are recording. Feel free to type your questions in the chat box and we're going to work We are going to answer questions at the end. Oh, I'm muted. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Oh, yes. okay. Thank you so much. So just a few reminders and we appreciate you. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to just start talking about, okay, what is a project? And think of an overview of the project life cycle, project planning, hear from Maryland Legal Aid about their experience and have times for a question and an answer. Now, we really wanted to start really from the basics, honestly, because we want to try to create within our community just a basic understanding of what is what are our projects, what is project management, and how do we have successful projects. So a project, we're getting many of these principles from the Project Management Institute, and you can find a lot of great resources online. Um, but projects are a temporary effort. Remember, think about time limited to create value through a unique product, service, or result. Now, all projects have a beginning and an end, right? They have a team, they have a budget, they have a schedule. They're unique. They're different from normal operations, although you can create projects around specific aspects of your operations within your organization. And projects conclude once the goal is achieved. And what is project management? And project management is the use of specific knowledge, skills, or tools and techniques to deliver something of value to people. Project management can be done in a variety of ways. When we talk about tools, project management can be done with a pencil and paper. Project management can be done with a whiteboard. Project management can be done with a lot of different ways with different types of their tools, their softwares, their resources. We don't want you to feel limited in your ability as organizations and legal aid providers to deliver quality project management because you don't have specific software. So why is this important for us? Because we wanna to try to keep projects and deliver them with the expected outcomes on time and within budget. And we have limited budgets. So we have to be able to use that money that we receive to have the most impact. We also know that you all are working very hard to achieve for our communities and these projects are helping to benefit our communities. So what's a project manager? A project manager is a person who either intentionally or by circumstances asked to ensure that a project team meets its goal. It's like an owner. They're managing how you're gonna use the different tools, different techniques and the approaches and the needs of the project. Now, you don't need an official project manager, right? It's okay. It's, but there are specific skills that are needed to engage in this work. And so those transfer skills are planning and organizing, managing tasks, budgeting, controlling costs. I know that many of you on this call have those skills, right? And so we're just gonna use those skills in the furtherance of achieving our project goals. So what's the project life cycle? I worked on this uh, for um, with the group that I work with, where we were trying to think about, okay, what's the project life cycle? And we realized they were broken down to multiple steps. And so we wanted just to think about, think of a project as sort of, it has a life. It could be a circular, it could be linear, but let's think about it in that way. So we're initiating the project. Prior to initiation of the project, what you may do is research and you're gonna learn more from, about Maryland Legal Aid's experience and the research that they did to start to determine that they were going to engage in that project. So in the initiate the project phase, you're defining the goals, right? It's definition, that's the process that you're going through right there. Think about the resources that are needed. You're thinking about risks. You think about who are the people who should be involved in this project. Then you're making the plan, right? You're gonna make the plan so you can achieve the goals. And that plan can be broken down into tasks, deliverables, but you really gotta think about there's work before you do the work of the project, before you work the project, right? I hope that you notice that on here, we have four different parts, phases, and executing on the tasks, which is like working the project, is only one part, right? So we execute and complete tasks. We monitor progress. 
try to keep our team motivated, remove any obstacles that hinder progress. We also think about like what are sort of what are some um, times within that period when we want to get buy-in from the stakeholders who may be part of the project or who may be beneficiaries of, of the project goal. And then closing the project out. This is a really important phase and many people don't sort of put it into their plans. And part of this is you're evaluating how the project went, you're getting feedback, you're getting, you're learning lessons. Like what lessons did we learn from this project? Um, within our organization, we call this our, our post-mortem. We're going to close the project and we're going to try to figure out what did we learn from what we were trying to achieve. Project planning. Now, why do you do it? Like big picture. And you're going to hear the why. You're going to hear the why from Maryland Legal Aid, which is going to be really exciting. And then the what. What are the deliverables? What are the expenses? We're thinking about what's the scope of the project? Because we want to make sure we try to stay within scope and try not to be aware of scope creep. We want to think about cost because we want to make sure that we try to stay within budget. This is really important for us, right? As we're thinking about how we're going to report to our funders, how we're going to report to our key stakeholders. And when there is a start date, there is an end date. Sometimes we go over our end date, but we have to plan for that. We have to think about that, right? Because if we go beyond that end date, we're still exerting resources. And those resources could be people's time. It could be a lot of different things. So we do have to be very cognizant of that time frame. And who, who does the work and also who benefits from the work? Like who are the key stakeholders that need to be part of this process? And how are we going to do it? Like what processes are we going to use? Are we going to use, for instance, we might create a project plan in Excel. We may want to map out the project in that way. We may want to use a software like, I don't know, Asana. We may want to use different ways about, that we can communicate and we can stay on task and ensure that we are delivering on what we were trying to achieve. So let's hear from Maryland Legal Aid because they're going to give us the real life example of how they did this. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chijioke Akamibo. I am a Deputy Chief Counsel at Maryland Legal Aid, and I oversee the legal work in half of our offices statewide. And um, joining me today is Natalie Coley Lawrence. Natalie is the Chief Attorney for what started out as our Baltimore City Intake Services Unit and has morphed into the centralized intake unit for the statewide. Um, operations. So you will hear from both of us throughout this presentation. Okay, so um, as we kind of embarked on this idea of centralized intake and really going forward with it, um, I realize and we realize we really need to know why are we doing this? We need to know what is our vision. Um, and so that was really our step one. What is the vision, the why of, of the project? Why is it necessary? What's the history um, of, of intake services, um, trying to do a centralized intake system? What is the history of the desire for it and the need for it? Um, what is the need in general? Um, why and how will the project help? Um, and who should be involved with the project? Um, you really want to answer those vision questions because that helps you formulate um, formulate your your processes and identifying the goal, your players, all of that um, comes into into play when you're talking about the why and the vision. Next slide. Um, the clear vision is important. You need to identify resources. You really need to get buy-in. So what we were you know, thinking of undertaking would be a big, big change for legal aid um, and how Maryland Legal Aid has done intake in the past. And buy-in is super important when you're proposing change. Um, we wanted to, the, the, the vision, clear vision is important for um, meeting the goals of the project um, and for overall success of the project. Okay, so um, our why kind of started from a report from a PQV that LSC did in 2014. And um, in 2020 or 21, when I was reviewing the PQV, um, it kind of was a little shocking to read that they thought our intake was disjointed 
and confusing. So as a proud Maryland legal leader, I was adamant that we were not disjointed. Um, so we set out to kind of see if they were right. Um, so we have 12 offices across the state and each office conducted their own telephone intake. Um, however, the client's experience was different depending on the office you called. Um, it appeared that in the past, legal aid had discussed a centralized intake um, many years before I joined legal aid. And um, it was just discussions and never really materialized. Um, however, it also seemed to us that centralized intake was a best practice for legal aid programs across the country and um, it was recommended. So what we did was we um, created a survey that we sent out to all of our offices and asked them to explain how intake happens. So um, we have a few examples of what um, was reported in different offices. So this is the first example. And um, so the client calls, uh, they get some basic information uh, they send an email to a bunch of people with that information. And then the client is put on a list and then they are called back um, to get more information. And then we have to check the conflicts and discuss with attorneys in the office. Um, if it's something we don't do, then we call them back and give them a referral. Um, and then later paralegal completes the intake. Uh, R-H-O-S-L-C. And then an email is sent to the intake team. And at some point that week, the cases are assigned. And if there's a determination that we couldn't take the case, then um, the case is rejected. So as you can see, it's pretty drawn out. And one of the issues is calling people back often has challenges because they may not answer or they might be busy or they're in the store. So um, that was one of the offices. Um, next slide, please. So the, ne the next office, um, the support staff collects the general information and then emails it to a paralegal. Uh, they contact the client and complete that intake process. Um, and then the person is assigned to an attorney. Um, the attorney then calls, gets more information, and then it sends to the supervising attorney who finally assigns that case to someone else. Um, again, it's a long process before the client gets, um, gets a resolution as to whether we're actually gonna uh, represent them. And um, as many of you know, many of our clients do not call with months or weeks to spare. So sometimes, their yeah, cases are coming up in the next week or two. Uh, next slide, please. So after getting that initial survey, um, we put together a team. So um, the team was myself, um, three chief attorneys and a member of our IT unit. Um, we scheduled regular planning sessions, um, usually early in the morning. So everybody was bright and ready to work. And um, we had frequent check-ins amongst us to kind of make sure everybody's doing what they were supposed to do before the next meeting came along. Next slide, please. Okay, so once, um, you know, we kind of did that initial looking at our system, um, we built the team, um, we, we moved into step two, which was really developing our, our plan. So um, vital for developing the plan was to get data. Um, we needed to see how many calls the various offices, various 12 offices throughout the state received um, on average. Now Baltimore City, which is our biggest office, uh, we already had a phone system in place so we could get actual numbers um, from those. The, the other offices had their own systems, so um, we, we surveyed them. Um, for 
I'm sorry, <laughs> that's okay. Um, for for plan development, you know, you also want to look at samples and other models. You want to consult um, with maybe other programs or consult in general to see um, what is out there, what's been done. Um, we needed to think about IT and logistical necessities and all throughout this process, um, staff feedback is important. So what we, what we did, um, we considered the LSC recommendations, we gathered current data, we surveyed the offices, we looked at other programs. That was all um, what Chichioki did sort of in the background. The rest of us were kind of thinking through the process. So as part of that uh, getting data, we um, tried to figure out exactly how many calls we received throughout our offices. Um, so the Baltimore City unit was kind of the outlier. They got about 1,400 calls um, a month. Uh, however, what we found is some of our offices didn't really track the number of incoming calls and the phone system wasn't capable of documenting that um, number of calls because every call came through a central office number and then they had options of maybe press six for intake. Most people didn't really press six, they might just press zero to speak to someone and then did the intake. So we, a lot of the numbers were estimates from the offices. Um, so very few, I think the Baltimore City, uh, Prince George's County um, were the two that were able to give us a little more solid data on the volume of calls. But on average, it looked like we were getting about 3,600 incoming intakes a month. So our guiding principles came from the LSC's characteristics of a telephone intake advice and referral system. So we hoped to um, kind of meet all these um, guidelines that LSC set out. Uh, one of the things we identified was the, a lot of our offices, when you called, the phone tree was a little too complicated. So they tried to be granular. If you call in for divorce or custody, press this, uh, domestic violence. It was very kind of, uh, by the time you got to what you wanted to select, you might have forgotten what you were calling about. Uh, so our goals were really to make sure that we aligned ourselves with these uh, characteristics that LSE set up. So we um, came up with an idea or a plan of what we wanted it to look like. So um, we were gonna get a 800 number and we tried to find one that had a catchy uh, name when you uh, put it that way. And then we wanted to have a two-step process. So when someone called, the first person they spoke to would be a paralegal who would screen them for case type, uh, conflicts, financial eligibility. And if they're eligible for our services, they will complete the intake there and then. And then will transfer them to an attorney queue and they get to speak to an attorney um, during that first call. So the attorney will uh, get more information on the legal aspects, um, provide brief advice if that's what it calls for, um, or also recommend them for full representation. So after speaking to the um, person, if they think they need extended representation, then they will tell them that they're gonna refer their case to one of the offices for representation. And then the chief attorney or supervising attorney of centralized intake reviews all the intakes at the end of the day that's been referred for um, extended representation just to make sure we're actually sending uh, the right types of cases to the offices. And then it's transferred via legal server, which is a case management system to that office for representation. And what we found is most, I'd say about 95 or more percent of the cases we sent to the offices are actually accepted for representation because we've uh, vetted them properly and they're ready for someone to just take it and run with it. 
So, um, like I mentioned, our goals, we wanted to align with um, LSC. So we wanted to create an easier way to navigate the phone system. Uh, in our, while we were drawing it out, we went from about um, 15 or 16 options to three is what we have now. Um, so it's, if you're a senior, because we have a specific grant and we want to kind of have someone that deals with the seniors. If you're a senior, you press one. If you're calling about a family law matter, two, any other legal matters, three. And it's kind of streamlined. Um, and you're still getting the same um, attorneys. Um, it's just more of a statistical thing to track those particular um, callers. We also wanted to improve language access. In the past, if you called and you selected Spanish, you were sent to a voicemail and you leave a message. And then when the Spanish paralegal comes in or is available, then they'll call you back. Um, that has its problems. Uh, so now we've integrated the use of language line. So if you call, no matter what language you speak, we can um, dial in language line and assist you on that call. We also wanted to have some uniformity of call scripts so that if you call with a divorce case and get paralegal A, they're gonna ask you the same questions that paralegal B is gonna ask you. And that also helps with when the attorneys are reviewing the case, they already have some basic information that they can just dig right in and uh, give you the advice. And when we send it off to the offices for representation, they already have some basic information that they need. So um, we really didn't want to reinvent the wheel because we have a bunch of other things that we were doing. So we spoke to other programs across the country that had uh, centralized intake. Uh, we got uh, their manuals and procedures and their processes. And we used that to kind of figure out what would work for us uh, the way we wanted to do it. So we use those manuals and processes that we found from other um, organizations to create a system that we felt would best suit what our needs were. We also asked our chief attorneys of our other offices to kind of give us input on what it is they think will be best um, based on what we've explained that we want to do. Um, most of them were positive, obviously, not everybody likes change. So there was some hesitancy as to, is this really going to work? We've seen other places try it and it didn't work. And I think one of the biggest pushbacks was, are you taking away our independence to make a decision as to whether we're going to take a case in our office? And the answer is no, that's not what we're doing. We're going to send you the case. And ultimately, it's your decision whether you have the capacity to take it. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, and then we moved to the IT. There's a ton of contact center software out there. There's the traditional um, services that still exist for call centers. And we wanted to figure out the best one for us. So uh, prior to joining Maryland Legal Aid, I was the managing director of Maryland Legal Aid subsidiary that runs the court self-help centers. And part of that was a call center. Um, they used Amazon Connect and Dexter. And since we're already familiar with the product, we went with it. It's easy. Um, to, so you could get someone off the street and I think in an hour or two, you can get them up and running on using Amazon Connect and Dexter. It runs in a browser so you can work from anywhere um, you're not tied to the office. And in this day and age, I think it was very useful to us. And it's also cost effective compared to other um, providers we looked at, um, the monthly costs were reasonable for us. Okay, so once we, we did all that, you know, got, did our research, got our data, um, looked at other office plans, um, worked on, on the manual, looked at other manuals, got our IT together. 
it really was time to kind of implement the project. So you kind of review the product, um, get it ready to finalize, get staff trained, get them on board, um, and continued feedback um, because that, that buy-in is very important for any kind of success. So what we did was um, I was I was really in charge of drafting the manuals. So it was very useful to have those manuals from the other programs to see what really looked like it would work for us, um, kind of weed out what wouldn't work for, for how we do things in our program um, and inter integrate it to um, sort of work alongside our um, bigger policy and procedures manual for Maryland Legal Aid. Um, so I went through and, and developed a manual so that we had a really good outline of, of the procedures for um, intake services. Um, we can, in the manual, there's the hours, there is procedures for walk-in intake, what offices are supposed to do when they do have a walk-in intake client, um, how the call flow should go, what the paralegal's uh, responsibility is. Um, with the call, how it should be entered into legal server, um, how it's then transferred to the uh, staff attorney that's going to provide the brief advice, um, how that brief advice is done, how the, how the case is then marked in legal server as to whether it is something to be closed on advice or whether it's something that the uh, staff attorney wanted to have reviewed for possible further representation. Um, also in the manual, uh, we put resource and referral information for um, case types that we don't handle at Maryland, Maryland Legal Aid. So it's all in one spot. Um, we put in our scripts. So all those questions are in one spot. Um, we put in how cases and to whom they go when they, they are to be transferred to the other offices. So really just thinking through the entire day in the life of handling centralized intake and, and documenting that so that we had a really good structure um, to answer questions and, and to present. So we planned, uh, after the, the manual was done um, it, and we got the IT all squared away, um, we planned it and held a two-day training for all staff. So the first day was substantive on that manual and policy and procedure. And the second day was hands-on with the contact center. Um, it was very successful. Um, people, I think, you know, left there with, with a little bit more security in what is expected of them with this, this new, um, new intake procedure we, we are having at Maryland Legal Aid. Um, and because we're, we have many counties and we really needed to ramp up staffing, um, we decided to do a soft launch. Um, our original plan was to try to, as part of doing our research, was to really try to use staff that we already had at Maryland Legal Aid. And they may be, such, they may be in different parts of the state, but because it's a cloud-based phone system, they could log in from their own offices and do intake. So we tried to identify where the intake paralegals were and in what office, who did the majority of their work was intake as opposed to any kind of case handling paralegal. Um, so we did get a few staff that way. Um, so they were part of, of our original um, staffing for telephone intake, and we used um, also the Baltimore City paralegals when they weren't doing walk-in intake. So we started with a soft launch. We decided to include five. Baltimore City was the biggest, um, and we decided, okay, let's go with these, and let's see how it goes. So we rolled everything out and had a start date and did it. Um, and I think um, the, one of the good things about just jumping in at the start date is we were all expecting the calls to be slow on the first day, but it wasn't. So everybody had to pitch in. I had never done telephone intake before that day, and I had to figure it out on the fly. I had to do full intakes, and it was helpful because then you could see how it worked. Um, but it was useful. Um, I think kind of our final thoughts is um, the day you launch is just the beginning. Uh, we've had to tweak the process. Um, the chief attorneys of the counties that we started the soft launch gave us feedback as to what worked for them, 
what they were looking for. And we were open to receiving that feedback and making changes if there were some things that we could change. Um, we, um, we kind of opened it up and said, whatever you think will make this work best, we're willing to work with you to get there. Um, we weren't, we were flexible, but we weren't willing to kind of give up. So if your, if your suggestion was, it's not working, we should go back to what we had, that wasn't something we were gonna be flexible on. Um, but everything else, we were willing to work with people to make it work. Um, like we've mentioned, change is hard, um, but continuing to kind of reach out to the affected offices, the staff, the chief attorneys, and to kind of get them to contribute to the program, I think helps with buy-in because now they feel a little more invested in making it work. Uh, and so far, the counties that we've switched, the chief attorneys have reported that it's helped their processes a lot more. They have more time to do extended representation cases and not just the brief advice. And they've kind of freed up their paralegals to do more substantive casework instead of just doing the uh, intakes. Natalie? Um, yes, and then, you know, the other thing with that, um, you know, change is hard and, and fostering buy-in are, we decided uh, to use the Baltimore City uh, staff attorneys because they already were providing that same day brief advice, but our system before was um, allowed for specializing. So we had attorneys that only answered senior calls, for example, and some attorneys only answered family law. With this part of the change with centralized intake is we wanted to make our attorneys um, be able to cross advise, you know, to become more generalists. And that was a little bit nerve wracking for um, the staff attorneys. So we had to, along, along with building the actual centralized intake system, really finding a way to build in um, this sort of cross training and ability for people to be able to reach out. So we use Microsoft Teams for that. Um, we have a couple of chat groups. We have a chat group for the paralegals, a chat group for the entire group, and a chat group for the staff attorneys. Um, we have three supervisors who monitor all the chats, and um, we, we allow people to really feel comfortable asking any question. And it's been really great, actually, because the attorneys have been jumping in and cross-training each other, and we um, work well with the chief attorneys in other offices. They are they are there to answer questions, so it's been um, it's been really good. So sometimes you kind of just have to power through the skepticism, um, as long as you feel confident that number one, you've kind of really thought it through. What is our process going to be? And number two, that's where the flexibility comes in. You know, if your if your process is maybe not the best that you're willing to say, okay, well, how can we improve it? We're still going to do it, but how can we improve it? And how can we help you feel comfortable? So um, I've, I've done that with the chief attorneys in other offices as well. I let them know you can run reports. We're not hiding anything. So you can run reports on what we close on advice. And if that's actually a case type that you wanted to represent in, or you have any feedback, please provide me feedback. And it's been really a, um, a, a collaborative effort, you know, kind of started out with a small group um, planning everything, but we've tried to make the rest of it collaborative so that everybody feels that um, they're part of the system, not that the system is put upon them. I think that really is, is a, a good way to go into any project you do, um, is that buy-in. Thank you so much. We're going to open it up for questions. I do have one question about the timeline. Can you just walk me through the timeline like from the research to now? When did you start this process? Just so people have an idea of for planning purposes. So the process we started, I believe, the first quarter of 21. Um, and the soft launch was um, in August. Uh, so we've had a few months now. And actually, we expanded to think, three or four more counties 
on the 1st of February. So uh, our goal is to hopefully by the end of the year have all the counties in centralized intake, but it all depends on staffing and staffing has been a challenge uh, during the pandemic. So our goal is to expand the paralegals to at least 20 and um, about 12 staff attorneys. So uh, as, as soon as we get a little more on the paralegal side, since they handle the first wave of callers, then we add more counties. So we're opening up to questions. You can put your questions in the chat. You can raise your hand. If not, I will have more questions because <laughs> I'm very interested. Well, while we're kind of waiting mm -hmm. um, for our audience to warm up to our speakers, um, I was just wondering if either of you could talk a little bit about um, in the planning stages, like the documentation throughout the project, like did you decide, um, you know, how you would be documenting your decisions throughout the project? And, um, you know, you talked about the manual, that documentation. Can you just talk a little bit more about how you documented your project? Um, we didn't really have a formal system of documenting, like the ad hoc committee that we had, we met. Uh, we did have some deliverables that we produced and we just saved those on our OneDrive, um, but we just worked, um, we sent out surveys, we kind of collected that information and put it together in a shared drive so that we could all access it and then discuss it at the next meeting. Um, but most of it was um, debating amongst ourselves as to what we felt was the best way forward. So much. It looks like we do have a hand raise, so uh, feel free to unmute yourself to ask your question, or you can type in the chat, and one of us will read it for you, whichever you feel most comfortable. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Carlia, and um, I wanted, I would like some more information about the buy-in, because I know that in projects, that can be um, one of the crucial things that uh, helps a project to succeed. And you were talking about um, the buy-in from the chief attorneys. And I was wondering how you um, kind of got them on board. And then my second question would be, um, how are you planning on uh, monitoring the project progress? Okay, thanks for that. So the, for the chief attorneys, I think the, um, the way we got buy-in was, after we did the survey, we kind of laid it out for them. This is what we have. And when people see it, and it, we produced the survey results, we collated it, like I showed you the examples. So when we actually showed people what they did and what we wanted to do, a lot of people kind of said, oh, that's gonna be better. Um, because in some offices, it took up to two weeks for someone to receive a determination as to whether we're gonna represent them. And while they, that's how they worked in their offices, they never really laid out that process in writing and see how it worked from the client's perspective. So when we showed them what that information was, um, people were a little more willing to listen to see if we could make it better. And then um, keeping them updated on what we were doing and planning. And also I think part of it is um, a number of the, uh, and three members of the committee were chief attorneys. So they were also able to talk to their uh, colleagues um, outside of the formal meetings we had with the chiefs. So they were able to sell it um, without, I guess, me as the deputy chief counsel. It wasn't like their superior was telling them, but it was someone that they worked with more closely was saying, this is gonna be great. This is what we are planning. And we also invited all the chiefs to the training. So they were able to play with the um, software themselves and see how it worked. They were able to listen to the training that the staff attorneys and paralegals got. So they had a lot more confidence that we were gonna do uh, good work. Um, so I think that helped. And I don't know if um, many of you are kind of familiar with Maryland, but it's, 
it very it has very rural areas it has very urban areas it's uh so there's different cultures and we're trying to bring all that together so some of the chiefs were worried that we might lose that cultural touch in let's say western maryland in the mountains and people were used they knew who they were calling so when they called the legal aid office in western maryland they knew who works there. So they were worried about losing that personal touch. Um, and those were things that we kind of explained that if there were any particular um, characteristics of their areas that they wanted us to be aware of, we were happy to kind of train the staff on things to look out um, and also willing to kind of adjust on the fly if there was something particular going on in their part of the state that they wanted us to be aware of. Um, we all we were open to working with them on that. Um, so I think that, um, from my perspective on the buy-in, Natalie, I don't know if you have any um, additional thoughts on that. Um, no, just to sort of expand on that, um, you know, you, change, recognizing that change is hard. Um, I think that um, we worked a little bit harder for that buy-in. Um, I think that it is in, it's important to be able to, and I think we did a good job of that, but when we were ready to launch, we actually had a solid um, plan and a solid project to present. So um, unlike in the past, when there were attempts to kind of centralize things within the state of Maryland among various programs, and also within Maryland Legal Aid, it was always just sort of hard to visualize, never something concrete. So we made sure that we did had a very concrete, well thought out project to present. And I think that helped with the buy-in. It was like, oh, okay, they really, you know, thought that through. And just a lot of, you know, open communication. I'm always available. Um, as, as part of that, um, I've created a county chart. We don't want things to be as they were before, where they were um, so different among the different offices. We do want some uniformity. So offices don't, you know, have that option to make everything completely how they had it before. But if there was something special that they had or a special client to look out for, whatever, I created a chart where I could put that in and then give that to all of staff so they could see right away, oh, this person calls Allegheny County all the time. Here's a little hint about them. And not to over do it. You know, I don't want to have 17 different things on charts along with the manual, make it very complicated for staff, but I'm at least letting the, the offices know we, we get it and we want to accommodate that in something tangible that I can show them. Look, we've made the chart, so everybody's gotten this chart. So as uh, so the second part of the question on monitoring, um, Amazon Connect has a lot of data, so we can... Um, we can keep track of the number of calls, how many calls are being abandoned, um, staffing levels. Um, so we are able to, we can look at the data and decide, for example, when we expanded to the uh, few counties that we did in February, we were able to look at that data and see that we could absorb this more um, number of calls um, from where we are now. So we, um, um, Natalie reports on the uh, on her data monthly, um, so we can keep track of what we're doing um, if we're if we have areas of improvement, uh, and then we go from there. Can I ask? Do you do any surveying of the callers post call? Um, right now, we don't. That's something we plan on um, starting soon because the, the software has the capability of um, doing the surveys. Um, but as a whole, Maryland Legal Aid hasn't generally done surveys, but we're working on um, starting those soon. So from the chat, um, someone is asking um, what plan, what platform are people uh, using? So if you all would like to share if you guys use a specific platform to track you know, the, the entirety of the project or if you have any insight on that. We did not. We didn't use any of the uh, project management. We used a lot of uh, 
Excel to kind of track uh, what we're doing. Uh, Outlook to calendar uh, events and deadlines, but uh, we didn't have uh, a particular project management program that we used. It's no problem. Uh, like Cascade was talking about in that um, intro, um, you know, you can do project management and project planning in so many ways. Um, I think it depends on who's leading the project, the personalities and the people involved. Um, you know, the there are a lot of tools that are very helpful um, out there. For me personally, I like old school. I make a folder and there's spreadsheets and documents and, and calendaring. And that works just as great as long as you're attentive and you're, um, you know, keep updating those documents. Um, but there was, there is some um, great suggestions in the chat. So make sure you check those out. I would think those things kind of depend on the project that you're undertaking. Um, as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the longer the project, the more important those um, tools are, um, because there's a potential for, um, you know, people that are involved to no longer be at the organization, um, for the project to shift a little bit when you have a project that's spanning, you know, years, sometimes, um, you know, things shift. Um, so I, I definitely agree with you, Natalie, that it just depends um, on, the, on the magnitude of the project. Um, does anyone else have any questions or um, any? We have a really nice comment. I yeah. really appreciate your implementation of the actual project and your process through engagement of your staff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a really great project. Mm -hmm. I love how, how just research-based. It just seems like uh, I'm, I'm was really impressed by that one when you talked to us about that earlier. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, can we revisit that a little bit and talk more about your initial research? Because I think that sometimes um, we get so excited about the possibility of a new endeavor that we kind of just are so ready to dive in that we kind of... Um, rush that that research component so you have if we could just revisit that a little bit and just talk about like what did that look for you I know you said you talked some to some other legal aids um maybe you could give us some insight on like how those conversations went um like you know what what were you looking to gather during that process well I think one thing I found was all the programs we spoke to were very um willing and happy to talk to us about what they do and I don't think we're looking for anything particular. We just said, talk to us about your program. How do you do what you do? What works for you? What would you change? So we just listened and took notes on what they do. Um, and then kind of discussed it with, within a group and said, well, we like this part of what they do. Uh, we don't think this will work so well for us. And the things we liked, we kind of made a note of. And, we kept talking to people. So um, in the end, what we came up with was kind of a, a mix of all the different programs we spoke to. Um, so to create what worked for us. Um, and I think with the research, we did a lot of research because we want, we knew we were going to have a million questions thrown at us when we introduced this project to um, our teams. So we wanted to be able to answer pretty much any question and optimism that we might face. So we wanted to have, well, this is how we're gonna do this. It's a little different from what we do now, but it really isn't. We're just doing it in a more streamlined way, or this is what we're trying to achieve. So we wanted to get all that information and educate ourselves before we went out and tried to convince other people to buy into the project. I think the research, I think the research as well um, is good for your own buy-in, right? You, you come up with this idea of a project, like, great, we want to do centralized intake. Does it even make sense? You know, how many calls do we get? How much staff are we going to need? Is this even a possibility? So once you start researching and actually looking at numbers, you start in your own mind realizing, well, this could work and this does make sense and we can maybe handle it or we need more staff. So I think the research is just 
it's it's good all the way around so that you you are coming up with a project that makes sense and that will work, but also that you feel um, you can manage and handle because you have the data there to show you that yes, this is doable. And if your data shows no, it's not doable, then that's valuable as well. Um, you know, then you you shift gears and think of maybe another process or another procedure that that will work. And we found there's some programs out there that you could put in your expected number of calls in a day, and it gives you an idea of what your staffing should look like. Um, obviously, as legal aid programs, we have restrictions on how much money we have. So um, we kind of aim to reach the optimal staffing level, but we also understand that there will be some wait time um, figuring out what might be acceptable is also a very tricky thing. So we keep an eye on how long do people wait before they hang up. Um, you get some people that are a little itchy that will hang up within a minute, but the average is normally six to 10 minutes before they give up. So uh, we try to tailor the number of staff we have towards that. sharing that uh, and circling back on that with us. I think that's really helpful um, to think about the, the research component and making sure we give that, that enough time and attention. Um, Cassia, do you have anything um, for our speakers? I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for being here and for walking us through this. This is exactly how we want it to go for this year, right? We really want to think about sort of grounding ourselves in the why and thinking, why are we doing this first? Having that research, that background information and really like engaging with our different stakeholders. So I'm really excited to have had this opportunity to hear from you about your experience. So thank you. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure. Yes, thank you very much.